welcome back. I left off the last video by telling you that our bodies do cool things with short chain pupas. You know that pupas are essential dietary components because our bodies can't synthesize them. We have to get these from our foods. These essential building blocks for our lipids, for our triglycerides, the essential component in the lipids in our adipose tissue, <laughs> we can't make them ourselves. We have to get them through our diets. But what we can do is synthesize long chain PUFAs from short chain PUFAs that we eat. And we do this through the activity of a suite of genes called the fatty acid desaturase genes, or FADs for short. Now remember from the last video that there are two main categories of fatty acids, omega-6 and omega-3. These are defined by how close that kink is to the end of the carbon chain. Now both the short chain omega-6 and short chain omega-3 are consumed via the diet. And then they are broken down and rebuilt and elongated a couple of times by the FADS2 and the FADS1 genes. And after this process, the end result are the long chain omega-6 and the long chain omega-3 PUFAs. And it is the FADS1 and the FADS2 genes that make this process unfold. Now you can also get the long chain PUFAs from your diet. So you get the long chains in two ways, from the food you eat and from your body's ability to synthesize them from the short chain PUFAs that you eat. So as you can see then, variation in diet could lead to variation in the PUFAs that a person has available in their body. Short chain versus long chain and omega-6 versus omega-3. Now as one example of this variation, there has been a dramatic increase in the levels of fatty acid consumption in the Western diet over the last few decades. So here in the United States, for example, you can see this in a comparison of the typical Western diet with that of a typical traditional diet. Fatty acids make up 28 to 42 percent of the total energy consumed in the average Western diet and just 20 to 30 percent of the total energy consumed in a more traditional diet. Additionally, the proportions of omega-6 and omega-3 vary significantly. Traditional diets have an N6-N3 ratio of 3 to 1, and Western diets have an N6-N3 ratio of 15 to 1. The N6 and N3 are used interchangeably with omega-6 and omega-3. Now, you can quickly figure out some of the potential implications of the increased proportion of energy consumed coming from fatty acids, but does the omega-6 and omega-3 ratio make any difference? Let's look at how the shape variation in these two types of fatty acids leads to pretty different effects in the body. Now, both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are important components of cell membranes. They serve as precursors to bioactive mediators to hormones. But omega-3 PUFAs have anti-inflammatory effects, and omega-6 PUFAs, they have pro-inflammatory effects. So with a shift um, to a Western diet high in omega-6 fatty acids, there is a coinciding increase in diseases that involve inflammatory processes. So cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, um, in 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 irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, neurodegenerative and psychiatric illnesses such as depression, and metabolic syndrome, so type 2 diabetes. So remember, omega-6 fatty acids are pro-inflammatory, and omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. Now you want both, <coughs> excuse me, but you want them in balance. Too much of one of them is not a good thing. Now with a shift to a Western diet high in omega-6 fatty acids, there is a coinciding increase in diseases, as we just mentioned. Now let's take a look at cardiovascular disease in particular for just a moment. Now, the more lipids a person consumes in their diet, the more lipids that person has circulating in their bloodstream. Now, from time to time, 
Lipids will get tripped up and they catch on the inside of the artery, one of the vessels that carries oxygen to all the tissues in the body. And this doesn't happen very often, but the more lipid circulating in the bloodstream, the more likely it is to occur. And once a lipid gets stuck, other lipids, they start to stick to it. And over time, a plaque builds up. And that plaque is called an atheroma, as you can see in this image. These buildups of fatty deposits and the scar tissue they create, it restricts the flow of blood. And that can lead to the formation of blood clots. So think back to what we just learned about omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory and omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. A stronger inflammatory response to these plaques, well, that just exacerbates the problem. A diet with a high proportion of omega-6 leads to an increased inflammatory response. And this is exactly what we see in the omega-6 heavy Western diet, health problems related to a hyperinflammatory response. But let's go back to basics and think about foods again, those sources of omega-6 and omega-3. Now, foods are not entirely one type of fatty acid. Rather, foods vary in their relative proportions of omega-6 and omega-3. So, for example, omega-6 is typically higher in plant oils and some cereals, animal fat and whole grain bread, and omega-3 is higher in green leafy vegetables, flaxseed, in um, rapeseed oil. Now you've likely heard the advice to eat salmon because it's rich in omega-3. Well, the reason that it's rich in omega-3 is because of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton that the fish eats. Salmon live in cold water. Now since omega-3 freezes more easily than does omega, um, since omega-6 freezes more easily than does omega-3, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton in the, those arctic waters, they have a higher proportion of omega-3. And therefore, so do the fish that eat them. Since the fatty acids in our bodies come from the foods we eat, Diet is clearly a very strong influence on the proportions of omega-6 and omega-3 PUFAs in our body. But biologists have found that genetic variation seems to explain about 30% of the variation we see in long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid levels for both omega-6 and omega-3. This variation corresponds to genetic variation in the FADS genes that I mentioned earlier in this video. So variation in FADS1 and FADS2 regulates the efficiency of this process, this breaking down and building back up process through which a person's body synthesizes, makes long chain PUFAs from the short chain PUFAs that they ate. Now some people do this pretty efficiently and other people, they do it more slowly. When geneticists first figured this out, ooh, immediately, there were hypotheses posed about this being related to major shifts in diet, and especially to major shifts that came along with agriculture. There was an excellent paper published a couple of years ago on this genetic variation, looking at gene sequence data from the ancient Denisovan genome, people from Sardinia, Italy and Europe, South Korea, the Yoruba in West Africa, France, also in Europe, and the Altai in Russia, which is kind of the very center of Asia. Now this figure should look somewhat familiar to the genetic distance trees, rooted and unrooted, that you've seen before in class. But rather than make you squint and try to see all of this, I've created a summary figure that's a little bit easier for our conversation. There are four major haplogroups in FADS1. This means that there are four major alleles with deep ancestry. A, B, C, and D. In most of Eurasia, essentially all of Africa and Neanderthals, people have or had a FADS1 allele that accelerated the, and so here you can see the populations that they, um, that correspond with these haplogroups. And I'll talk you through now the phenotypic effect alongside which of these populations it corresponds mostly to. So in most of Eurasia, and essentially all of Africa and Neanderthals, people have or had a FADS1 allele that accelerated the synthesis of long-chain PUFAs from short-chain PUFAs. And so it turns out 
that even the most recent major haplogroup didn't actually correspond with the advent of agriculture. So it doesn't actually look like long-chain fatty acid synthesis in agriculture are um, an example of gene culture evolution. It doesn't seem to be the case. But that said, there is evidence of selection on FADS1 variation. I want to draw your attention to haplogroup A. This haplogroup is associated with a decrease in the synthesis of long-chain fatty acids from short-chain fatty acids. This haplogroup is seen at high frequencies of people of some specific Eurasian ancestry and Native Americans. Let's look at a distribution. Let's look at a distribution map. There are four major this map of the continent shows the frequency of haplogroup A in various populations across Eurasia and the Western Hemisphere. Now the red, orange, and yellow indicate a high frequency. The greens and blue indicate a low frequency. And you can see that FADS1, haplogroup A, is at a high frequency in the indigenous populations in the Western Hemisphere, in Greenland, and also in some populations in the Arctic region of Northwestern Russia, near the Kara Sea. So with that, we're going to pause for a moment and pick up that, that story a little bit to explore a little bit more what that selection might actually have been for. 